Hey folks, Matthew Lanigan here with Baywa RE. We're just going to give it another minute or two. We still see quite a few people signing in and we'll be right back with you in about two minutes. Thanks. Hey folks, Matthew Lanigan here again with Baywa RE. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer here at Baywa. Uh, really appreciate y'all taking the time to be with us and Fronius and uh, learn a bit more about their, their products. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, this will be recorded, so we will share it on our YouTube channel. If you haven't signed up for our YouTube channel yet, I would like to recommend that you do. All our past webinars are on there as well. This will also be shared during our monthly newsletter as well. Uh, we will be taking questions, so please just put them down into the bottom right corner. We'll do our best. Uh, Harsha will answer them on the fly, so we'll do them in real time as much as possible. Um, continuing education is a, a big part of what we do here around Baywa, so we're really happy uh, that you have joined us for this. And without further ado, we'd like to introduce Harsha uh, technical Support Manager with Fronius. Harsha? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Harsha, and um, I work Harsha Kumar. That's my full name. And um, I work as a Technical Support Manager here at Fronius Canada, and I've been in this position since 2017. Um, my experience in terms of work is in power systems, power electronics, product design, and solar electronics. And, um, you know, it comes very much in handy um, help being able to use all of that knowledge and help support people. Uh, when it comes to design or you know operations or troubleshooting with solar systems and if everyone's set then i'm going to jump right into my presentation so um to start with i'll just give you a little bit about um Fronius itself so Fronius is a family-owned business and uh, Fronius is an actual person's last name, and it was started by Gunther Fronius. It's the gentleman in the picture leaning up against his car in Pettenbach, Austria, in the year 1945. And um, the business actually started with uh, automotive battery chargers, and you can see an example of an early one. It's a huge clunky thing that he's got there, right up there by the car. Now, um, Fronius' primary expertise is in hardware, power electronics to be precise, and uh, the primary application of said hardware would be power conversion, which is basically converting electrical energy from AC to DC, which is how it started out, because you had to get AC power from the utility or the grid and use your charge controller for the batteries because your batteries are DC. So that charge controller would take AC power, convert it to DC of the required voltage and current and use that to charge your batteries in a way that it wouldn't kill your batteries. Now, the next step was uh, Fronis got into the other part of, um, you know, 
power conversion, which is basically welding equipment, because that too is just conversion of power again. Of course, there's more of it than wheel conversion, but uh, that happened, happened to be the big um, bread and butter for Cronies for a very long time. And the youngest business unit is what we call the solar energy business unit. So Cronies has primarily three business units, um, which we call um, charging, or perfect charging, and then we've got a welding, and then we've got solar energy. And this is just um, the three business units that I told you about. Now, um, although Fronius Manufacturing is in Austria, we do have subsidiaries uh, based in different countries, and uh, our Canadian subsidiary is what we call Fronius Canada. So we are local, we are diversified, so we do not um, you know, depend on just one, um, should I say, business unit. We've got all three, although the perfect charging isn't as, uh, what should I say, aggressively promoted because all of our chargers are more IEC and international certified rather than US certified, which would be a basic requirement here in Canada. But even otherwise, we do get quite often a lot of inquiries about perfect charging as well. So we are diversified, we are invested in terms of people, we are bankable, we've been here since 2007. Although the solar energy did not start out in 2007, we started in 2010 when we had the FIT contracts in Ontario here. Till then, people did buy Fronius solar inverters too, but they would have bought them from Fronius USA. Now, outside of that, uh, we do believe uh, very much in the concept of service. So, um, because basically, you know, sales has to be supported by good service because if you don't have service to follow up your sale, that sale is gonna be a one-time sale, your customer's never gonna come back to you again. So, which is the reason why we do invest in a lot of local uh, people here to make sure that you get the best technical support possible. Um, and so that people who are local are always aware about local conditions, be it weather, be it you know anything else, be it technical changes or new requirements from your utility. And we are also very responsive and we do have the options of you leaving us voicemail. We, our support is primarily based in the Eastern time zone. We are here in Mississauga, but uh, don't, don't be put off by you know saying that we are only gonna work within Eastern work uh, hours. We also do make appointments, uh, even for weekends sometimes. Um, so we'll always just ask if you do have any questions, um, just, you know, just ask. Now, in terms of quality, quality is something that we are heavily, very heavily invested in. And um, this is just to show you an example of how our monitoring um, output looks on a system that's been up and running since 2011. Now, this snapshot of said system was taken much earlier this year. That's the reason that you only see a very small portion for the bar chart for 2022. Now, um, I did tell you that um, previously, um, before 2010, when we did not have a solar arm in Canada, a lot of inverters were purchased from from East USA, and they've actually worked for a very, very long time with absolutely no problems. So we still get calls from people who have a 17-year-old inverter, which has never acted up and you know worked flawlessly for them. And then we do let them know that warranties on inverters, the standard warranty is 10 years. So if you do have problems with it, we can get it fixed for you at a cost. And um, usually what those people do is because they've had such good service from the piece of equipment that they'd rather have that fixed and continue using the same thing, um, which we also provide as a service. In a sense, if you do have older equipment that you want fixed, we will help uh, get that fixed for you. Now, in terms of our present offering, uh, we do have for, on the three phase line, we have the SIMO. The SIMO is short for um, symmetrical phase, which is what three phase power supply is called in Europe. Okay, and on the SIMO line, we've got two uh, AC voltage um, you know, um, options. You've got the 208, 240, three phase AC, or you can have the 480 volt AC. We do not make a 600 volt AC inverter. So should you need to have this compatible with a 600 volt grid, you would need to interface that with a transformer, which is gonna bridge the 480 volt inverter to the 600 volt grid, okay? Now on the three phase 208 or 240 volt AC systems, you've got the 10 kilowatt and the 12 kilowatt inverters, which are both two MPPT inverters in terms of your string connections on the DC side, and the DC voltage for these inverters would be 600 volt DC. These are not a thousand volt DC inverters, okay? But we do also make a 15 kilowatt 208 volt AC input inverter, which is a thousand volt inverter on the DC side, but it is a single MPPT inverter and was designed to be used on ground mounted arrays, not roof mounted arrays, okay? So which is the reason why it does not have an RSV compatibility, RSV being rapid shutdown box, so should you need rapid shutdown compliance, this inverter, the 15 kilowatt 208 volt AC, 1000 volt DC inverter will not do the job for you. Now the 10 and the 12 kilowatt 208 or 240 volt AC, 600 volt DC inverters 
um, are uh, rapid shutdown compliant and they're also sun spec. Um, and also Chromius does not make a module level uh, rapid shutdown device. What we do make is a string level rapid shutdown device. So should you need to um, you know, uh, use uh, Sunspect rapid shutdown module level, you can use them with other third party vendors like that of AP systems with which we are compatible. And also we've got the largest 208 volt three phase inverter, which is a 15 kilowatt inverter. But like I mentioned earlier, it's got a single MPPT and is not rapid shutdown compliant. Now on the uh, 480 volt AC inverters, we go all the way up to 24 kilowatts in the uh, steps that you see there. So we've got 15, 20, 22.7, and 24. These are the ones which happen to be a lot more popular for commercial systems. On the DC side, these inverters are all 1000 volt DC, not 600 volt DC. So should you need to have these work at a 600 volt DC, please do get in touch with us and we'll uh, see what we can do for you there. But by and large, these are meant to be used on 1000 volt DC strings, all right? Now, these are SunSpec compliant and they can be utilized with module level shutdown like that of AP systems. Outside of that, we've also got the single phase line, which is Primo, okay? So it's um, Primo being, you know, primary, which is like single phase. And in that, we've got two frame sizes, which we call the smaller one, which typically is what is used in a residential application, starts at 3.8 kilowatts, through 5, 6, 7.6, 8.2, and 10 kilowatt. Now, all of these inverters, the primary single phase inverters that I'm talking about, can be configured to work at both 600 volts DC and 1000 volt DC, okay? And these are rapid shutdown compliant, but not module level rapid shutdown compliant. So if you do want to use them, then you would need to have a module level transmitter to work with the receiver, because you, if you uh, were looking at the picture previously, those were sun specs, so they can actually Keep, uh, produce you a keeper lab signal to work with module level shutdown like that of AP smart systems, but these won't. So you would need to use these with a transmitter as well. Now, in terms of mounting itself, um, these inverters can be mounted flat or they can be mounted vertical and any angle between vertical and flat, but not such that the face is facing down. Okay, that is not an up mounting option. That is kind of um, pointed out in the little diagram you can see on the right side. All right, so please do make sure that you never have the inverters mounted in a place where you have a lot of animal activity. That is the reason that you have that thing there saying that do not have them in your animals. That is simply because animals can hear a wider range of sounds than we can. And we've had situations where people put these in places where animals would pick up on sounds that we cannot hear. Okay, so that's you know, something you do not want to do. Outside of that, also do not make a mounting motor where you have hazardous gases or flammable gases about you. Now, in terms of shade, these inverters can be mounted up there on the roof, but the inverters will behave and last you much longer if you were to use them with a shade cover. It's kind of, you know, almost like saying your car will look better and, you know, last you better in good shape, you know, with good appearance if you were to pack the car in shade as opposed to having it parked right under the sun. Now, here's an example where you can see that they mounted the inverters on, a, you know, like a solar parking um, yeah, lot, if you will and they've got the inverters mounted right underneath. But if you do want to have them right up there on the roof, maybe to get around your rapid shutdown requirements, that is also possible. Just use you know, a shade cover to go with it. Promise does make shade covers. So should you need any, you can always get in touch with us. They're designed to go on the racking. So that way you'd have to make minimum um, you know, changes. Now in terms of shading, this is something that's quite often brought up. Um, so there's a lot of, um, what should I say, um, talk about shading and performance and things like that. So one thing you have to keep in mind is uh, a lot of people will come to us and say that, oh, we have shading here. Would it be okay to use optimizers? Now the thing is, there's different ways you can tackle the shading question, okay? And more often than not, you can tackle shading without actually throwing on extra electronics because electronics, uh, like if you were to look at it from a longevity perspective, the PV module, which is your solar panel, uh, in, in layman's terms, is the last thing to fail on your system because that is static. It's got no active electronics on it. If a PV module is failing, it's usually because of physical damage. Maybe you got struck by hail or you know something was chucked at your PV modules and it cracked the glass, et cetera, okay? And also, by and large, the cost of PV modules tend to be on, on the you know downward trend. So throwing more expensive electronics, which is likely to fail earlier and you know more likely it's when you come to electronics not a question of will it fail it will fail it's a question of when right and that typically is not under our control because it's your site conditions the quality of the workmanship and other factors which influence all of that 
But even otherwise, when I've got a PV module and, in, and a piece of uh, electronics, I, I pretty much know for sure that the electronics will fail before the PV module. And so uh, why would you want to throw on something that fails faster and you know it's gonna fail faster than something that you know is gonna fail lower? But, um, and I know that a lot of people will use the argument saying that you're losing out in power. But there's different ways you can tackle that problem than just throwing more and more electronics, which are more failure prone than the you know, a static PV module itself, right? So there's different approaches, like I mentioned. I'm just going to walk you through a few. Now, in terms of shading, what shading actually does for you is it makes the PV arrays power characteristic pop up with multiple maximum power points, okay? MPP is short for maximum power point. MPPT is short for maximum power point tracker. Now, if, uh, if you look at the plot here, you'll see that curve in blue has a GMPP. So the GMPP is short for global maximum power point. And were you to not be afflicted by shading issues, that is literally how the power curve of a PV array or a PV module would look. Now, if you did have shading issues, depending on the time of the day and what level of radiation you got and, and how the shading itself is affecting the array, you can end up with multiple LMPPs, LMPP being local maximum power point. So this is just showing you two, but you can have several. And obviously each of those maximum power points will give you power at different magnitudes. And what you want to do ideally is to sweep the entire curve and determine which is the best of these, which would be the GMPP, which is short again for global maximum power point. Now, how do you accomplish this? There are several different proprietary algorithms, uh, you know, which are used by several different manufacturers. And all of, they, uh, all of those algorithms, what they do is they sweep this entire curve and make an evaluation to settle on which one is the best to operate. Okay, so that's one thing. There's a second part to it as well. The algorithm is not static in the sense, we know that light, temperature, radiation, shading, all of these are, are dynamic. They keep changing on the fly, which means that this curve which you are seeing here is actually moving in time. All right. So when it moves in time, your algorithm also has to move with said curve, which means that your curve has to be swept at periodic intervals. And the sweep frequency for that sweeping business itself is proprietary too. So depending on how frequently you sweep and how accurate your algorithm is on settling on the global maximum power point, as opposed to being sidetracked by the local maximum power point, determines how effective the inverter is in mitigating shading issues. Okay. So now with Fraunius, our proprietary algorithm is what we call the dynamic peak manager or DPM for short. Now, if you're looking at the picture here, you will see that it's, it's actually a GIF and you'll see that the clock is showing you the time and it's also showing you how the shadows move across that PV array you see there or PV module and how the, the, the sweep curve, you know, the swept curve, sorry, uh, I, I told you the curve is moving and changing all the time. You'll see how the power point on that curve is also changing all the time, all right? So the job of the inverter is basically to sweep this curve in real time at a certain frequency and settle down upon the best maximum global power. Okay, so what we've determined through our own testing, I'll get to that in a little bit, is that um, our algorithm for the dynamic peak manager performs as well or better in most of the situations and might you might have, uh, you might stand to gain a little bit if you were to go with uh, module level power electronics, but those are under very specific conditions and I'll show you how it might not be worth the effort to go in for module level power electronics. Now in terms of the inverters operating range, uh, our inverters are built to operate in Canada. So we've got um, I just over the last week and I was helping another one of our good clients set up their uh, inverter. Uh, I think uh, for it, it's the northernmost solar installation in all of North America. It's at 76 degrees north. So the place is called Greasefjord. And um, the temperatures there, as you would expect, are pretty uh, extreme. And these inverters are built to withstand that kind of weather. So um, they work all the way up to minus 40 C. Now, if your temperatures did go even lower, what the inverter will do is it will just sh shut itself off as a protective mechanism. So these are well built to last you that temperature. And a lot of these inverters are mounted outside. So they're directly looking and facing those temperatures. Okay, now on the high side, these inverters work just fine all the way up to plus 60 degrees um, C, okay? Um, the reason being we've got 
um, active and passive cooling. Now, a lot of people will bring up the issue saying that, oh, when you have active cooling, active cooling basically saying you've got forced ventilation, which implies there's a fan spinning somewhere. Um, would you not you know, think that the fan is gonna fail? Uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, you know, fan failures are actually the, the least, you know, the least concerning failures because we had that low a failure rate for fans. In fact, we've never had you know as many failures as somebody else would assume you might in way to have forced ventilation. Now, in terms of the ease of using these inverters, the inverters come um, with what we call the snap technology. What that means is, so um, you know when you wire the inverter up, let's assume that you know you need to change out the inverter for whatever reason. Maybe it was a you know a, a product issue or there was something that happened to the inverter. You got struck by lightning, and you, you are in a situation where you need to have the input exchanged. Now, to save you the trouble of having to rewire your exchange inverter or a new inverter, uh, we came up with this idea where you've got what we call a mounting bracket. The mounting bracket is what you're seeing on the left. Um, so you've got that white terminal block in the middle on which you've got all of your PV wires ran and you've got the AC wires land on the right side. That is what we call the mounting bracket with the termination block on it. So there's no active electronics there. All of that is just mechanical and passive components. The actual electronics is what goes into the power stage. The power stage has been swung out of the mounting bracket in the picture on the right side. So the power stage is where all of the active electronics and the guts of the inverter are. Supposing you do need to have your inverter exchanged for whatever reason, you will receive an exchange power stage on a dummy mounting bracket. What you would do is swing out your power stage, which is acting up on the site, replace that with the dummy, uh, sorry, with the actual power stage, the replacement power stage on a dummy mounting bracket, put the defective power stage back on the dummy mounting bracket in the same packaging and send it back to us, and you're good to go because you don't really need to redo any of your wires. Okay, so it makes it real easy and very quick. And depending on the capacity of the inverter, it could just be a one-person job to do. Now, in terms of the service and support, so uh, we do have different ways of supporting you, okay? So we do have our support line. You can always call into the support line. You can either choose to leave us a voicemail or ask to make an appointment. We do request that you give us at least two days notice uh, because we, we, you know, we would, like in the event that we do have made appointments for somebody else, it wouldn't be nice for us to have to cancel on them because somebody else has requested an appointment at the same, appointment at the same time, which is why we ask that you give us at least two days notice. Now, uh, if there are issues that can be resolved over the phone, we always will. If not, we'll write you an email and give you detailed instructions as well. Or you can always call us and make appointments, like I said, sometimes even over the weekend, uh, if it's absolutely necessary. Outside of this, we do also have what we call the Thronius Service Provider Program, FSP for short. What that means is we have um, technicians with, which, uh, with whom we would have worked for several years and we can trust the quality of their workmanship. What we do is we invite them over uh, to be trained. It's a three-day course. It's like going to school. It starts at eight and finishes up in five. And what I do is basically I make sure that the person is very well trained in terms of troubleshooting, not just the device, but the system. Because more often than not, a lot of people do not realize that the inverter is the only smart component in the entire solar system. By smart, I do not mean it's capable of solving, you know, it does have an IQ or, you know, it can sit for a math test. What that means is, were there to be issues in your system, the only person who's going to notify you or complain or make some noise about it is the inverter. That need not necessarily imply that the inverter is the source of the problem. You can have a break in the insulation somewhere else and the inverter is picking up a leakage current through its neutral on the AC side and notifying you there's a break in the insulation. But that it does not mean the inverter is at fault there, but there is a problem elsewhere, which if not fixed soon enough, could damage the inverter. And so what you would do is basically through your monitoring, you kind of, you know, not let that happen. That's the intention. So, uh, which is also, you know, the reason why we insist that you get monitoring because monitoring is not fancy bells and whistles. So you can do a nice show and talk to your neighbors and show your solar system off, that's nice, but that's not the primary intention. Your monitoring is actually a health monitor for your system. And if you do have live monitoring with an active internet connection, you can set the system up to notify you via email, um, you know, when, when the system's acting up or there's something that's going south um, and, you know, it's so that you can address the issue and fix it before it become, becomes an even bigger and more expensive problem for you later. Okay. Now, 
all of um, Fronis and Boto's are field serviceable. There are parts on the inside of it. When I say parts, they're printed circuit boards, which can be changed out, which is where the value of the Fronis service provider program comes in because the Fronis service provider is required to have on him kits. Kits are basically torn down inverters in such that when he comes up or you request a call from a Fronis service provider, uh, he will drive up to your place and the idea being he's got enough parts on him to be able to fix that in one truck roll for you as opposed to a regular installer who would need to go to the site for the first time and call it in to have the problem diagnosed and should there be a need for a replacement then we send out the replacement which would be another truck roll so the idea here is to you know through the frony service provider program we invite people like i said earlier who we have worked with for quite some time because we trust them and they you know once you know how the person works then you can get them over and get them trained um you know in in such way okay now outside of that in um in our product offerings we've also got the fronius rapid shutdown box or sb for short we call them the duo and the quattro so um we only make rapid shutdown um, solutions for string level rapid shutdowns and only 600 volt dc and under we do not have a rapid shutdown solution for a thousand volt string because there are different ways you can approach that rapid shutdown question now, here's an example of how you would use a duo or a quattro. Now, most residential installs are required to be under 600 volts DC, and this is where they are more often used than not. So you can use these either with the primos, because the primos, like I mentioned earlier, can be shrunk uh, for both 600 and 1,000, or you can use them with the SIMO 208, the 10 and the 12 kilowatts, because those are primarily 600 volt DC only. They cannot be shrunk for 1,000 volt DC on the DC side. Outside of this, in terms of our offering for monitoring, we have the Fronius Data Manager. You can purchase inverters with data managers pre-installed in them at the factory, okay? Um, or you can purchase them as an add-on. If you need to purchase them as an add-on, please make sure that your inverter does not already have a data manager with you, because this would just be superfluous in that case. Now, the way the data manager works is your system um, may or may not be comprised of more than one inverter. But as long as your uh, number of inverters per site is under 100 or your daisy chain, um, the daisy chain being cabling, uh, communication cabling, which is basically RS422. So we still recommend that you use uh, CAT5 or CAT6 shielded cabling between the inverters. So you've got to hook them up in a loop, which we call the daisy chain. And one of the inverters in said daisy chain needs to have the data manager. So the, the limit on the system is, like I mentioned earlier, 100 inverters, or if I add up the sum length of the cabling between inverters, one kilometer is the length. Whichever happens first is the limit on the size of your system. And what the data manager does is he gathers, he, it gathers production information and all of the other parameters from each of the inverters via the daisy chain, and you will need to provide said data manager internet access. But once you've set up the data manager with an account online, then the data manager, assuming you've got live internet, will gather production information from the inverter or inverters and via the internet connection will transfer that information onto your monitoring account. So your monitoring account is required to be set up on the Fronius website. Now, once you do set that up, you can access this data three ways. One is you can approach it via an app on your phone or you can use a browser page, in which case you would basically log into the actual website or you could also use an application which we call Solar TV. So if you have a smart TV, you can basically, you know, this is very commonly used in places of high foot traffic, like, you know, maybe it's a, a school um, you know, or um, a mall, maybe they have a solar system on their roof, or maybe it's a train station or an airport or someplace like so, where you want to show people that you've got solar on your roof, it won't give you as much detailed information as you could possibly access to either through the actual browser by going on to solar web or the app. Because like I mentioned, these are uh, the solar TV is not per se meant for interaction, but more of a show and tell. And so the, the, um, the display is a little different there. So we've got, like I mentioned earlier, three platforms. You can either log into the website itself, you can use the app, or you can log into your solar TV. And all of the monitoring service is actually provided for free. So there is no charge for any of the monitoring. The only charge you would incur is in providing your internet connection and in purchasing the hardware, the data manager card. Okay, now um, your product registration is all user driven. So uh, if you have monitoring, you can go online and do it, you need the registration that is. If you don't have monitoring, you'll need to make a note of your serial number and have proof of the installation date, okay? 
And, and uh, once you have all of that information, you can log into your solo web account, even if you don't have monitoring. If you want to register warranties, you'll need to create yourself a solo web account. So you go in there and register the warranties there. Outside of that, we also do offer a Fronius weather station. Okay, I won't call it a weather station. We actually call it the sensor box or the sensor card. And what kinds of weather data can you use uh, with said sensor box or sensor card? You can uh, re you know, record ambient temperature. You can record radiation. So we've got the radiation sensor. You can record module temperature sensor. Uh, if, sorry, module temperature with the module temperature sensor. You can also record wind speed. Okay, so you have to keep in mind that the location of each of these sensors to a very large extent determines the accuracy and value of the information that you would get from these weather sensors. All right, so there's no point in you recording irradiations uh, if you've got the radiation sensor facing a different direction than the rest of the array, because the idea is you want to measure the radiation as seen by the array. Okay, we're not interested in radiation from different directions because that's not what your solar system is recording. So that is why it is very important that proper attention be paid to the location and orientation of each of these weather sensors if you intend to get proper and valuable data from the site. Um, outside of this, we do also have what we call is a Fronius smart meter. So uh, smart meter in the sense it's not like your hydrometer or the utility smart meter. It's a bit different in the sense, supposing you've got, I don't know, like um, a big garage where uh, you've got enough roof space and you're, you've got enough you know, production, but you also got equal uh, consumption. And then you want to see how much you're making or not in the sense, your solar system is always going to tell you how much you're making or not. But if you did throw on a smart meter on the same property, the, depending on the location of the CTs for the smart meter, you can record what is being consumed on the property. And, and in, as you're aware, it's not necessary that there's always enough light to make up your consumption. So in the event that you do not have in, enough uh, production from your own solar system, the shortfall is going to be made up by what you purchase from the utility. And this smart meter is going to be able to tell you that should you set it up the right way with the CTs in the right positions. Okay, so uh, with the Fermi smart meter, you can see production and consumption. With just solar web and no smart meter, you can see only production and no consumption. Okay, and there's a little bit of uh, you know data manipulation and, and analytics that you can do on solar web. I'll show it to you in a bit. And outside of this, if you have any uh, restrictions, maybe your substation to which you are um, connected has um, reached capacity, uh, like we often encounter in Ontario. So um, the utility which we call Hydro here will come in and say, I've got no more capacity, so I cannot permit you to throw on a solar system. So in those situations, what you would do is you, you would set the system up with a feed-in constraint, which we call feed-in limitation. Or, so the way you would do is basically you throw your CTs on the arm through which you're being fed by the utility. And you set it up such that you never want to have reverse power flow because the utility has already made you well aware that they've got no more capacity to handle any production. So in those situations, what you would do is you'd always be permitted to buy from the utility, but you're never permitted to sell back. Or if you are permitted to sell back, there's a certain limit only. So if, were, if you were in such a situation, you can set your system up with the utilization of a smart meter to have a fixed feed-in limitation or a zero feed-in limitation, which we call zero export or limited export systems. I'll show you one such in, in a bit. Now, outside of this, we do also offer training because, um, as most of you would have realized, that your you know your product is only as good as uh, you know how good your support is, and how good your support is is going to be determined by how easy it is for people to understand what you're saying. Which is why we also do offer trainings. Um, so we do offer webinars. There's uh, two webinars every month. It's on the second and the fourth Wednesday at uh, 11 Eastern to make sure that we can accommodate our people from all time zones across Canada. Outside of this, we do also um, make custom webinars. So if you have a new crew who's coming on, or maybe they've got a different experience, maybe they've only worked with older technology inverters, which are transformer-based inverters, and all of our current offering um, in terms of the product line is transformer-less inverters. So the way you would work on these would be a little different as opposed to transformer-based inverters, or maybe you're trying to retrofit the site. So for all of these, if you do have any re uh, requests, you can always put it in and we'll come up with an offering for you. And just so you're aware, we don't really charge for any of these trainings. All of these are offered for free. Now, um, Harsha, this seems to be um, yep. Hi, Harsha. We, we've got a question. Somebody would like a little bit more uh, explanation of the uh, duo quattro boxes. Sure. 
Um, what exactly were they looking for? Raz, can you elaborate on what you're looking for here, if you don't mind? Just basically saying they don't understand how it works. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, I'll put it this way. Uh, I have a question. Um, when they say they don't understand how it works, um, is it, does, am I to understand that they don't understand how rapid shutdown works or how this rapid shutdown works? Do the inverters have an RSB already? They do not. Okay, so no, no inverters, uh, Fronius inverters come with any RSB, okay, simply because these inverters are made uh, for worldwide consumption and the only countries who need RSB are Canada and the States. So that's the reason that the RSB is offered as a separate product and also, a rapid shutdown has two com components. One is disconnection and the second is bleed there, all right? So um, the disconnection basically means that based off of your jurisdiction or whichever code you follow, the requirement will say that you need to have a point of disconnection within a certain distance. If I were to draw a parameter around the solar array, based off of whichever code you follow, they'll say that you need to have a point of, or a means of disconnection within a certain distance of said array which is the reason why we don't have the rapid shutdown within the inverter, because there is no guarantee that you can always accommodate the inverter within that distance of the array. So what you would do in those situations is you would have the rapid shutdown box um, mounted within that distance, because the point of disconnection is the rapid shutdown. Okay, the second component is bleed down. What bleed down means is the cabling from beyond the rapid shutdown box or your point or means of disconnection down into the inverter will be at the voltage of the array till you disconnect the array from that cable, right? But just because I disconnected the array from the cable didn't mean the voltage on the cable is gonna go down because like I mentioned earlier, rapid shutdown has two components. One is you've got to disconnect within said distance. The second thing is the cabling after the point of disconnection needs to come down to under 30 volts in under 30 seconds, which is the bleed down requirement. So the inverter has what we call a bleed down circuit within. So the moment the rapid shutdown is triggered, the inverter will bleed that circuit down and the disconnection is already taken care of by the rapid shutdown box, which is why you will need to have your rapid shutdown box mounted within present code is three feet or one meter of the array. And also you have to make sure that the rapid shutdown box is never exposed to sunlight. You have to make sure that the rapid shutdown box is tucked underneath a PV module. And depending on whether you go with a rapid shutdown box duo or a rapid shutdown box quattro, um, you can connect so many strings. In the sense, each rapid shutdown box can only handle you 25 amperes, which means it can only handle you two strings worth of current. But the duo has only one feed in and one feed out. So should you need to use two strings on that duo, you will need to purchase a Y connector so that you can Y two strings in. Okay, so anytime you're wiring two strings in, that's effectively two strings in parallel. Please make sure that both strings are of the same length in terms of the number of PV modules you've got stacked in series on each string, and that they face the same direction at the same pitch, because even if you've got the same number of PV modules in series on each string, should they not face the same direction, effectively they would be you know, two different string lengths, because the open circuit voltage and the current on them will be affected by the orientation, and if the light isn't gonna strike both strings at the same angle, then obviously the way they would give you power would be in with different characteristic curves. The same logic holds for the Quattro. It's just that the Quattro has two channels with, uh, and each channel is capable of handling you 25 amperes each. So the same logic, if you want to put two uh, strings on each channel, you would need to purchase Y connectors. Does that answer the question? Great, yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so we were speaking about warranties and then we went to this and the smart meter and the training, yeah. Okay, now outside of this, um, this seems to be a, a really hot topic, at least for us in Ontario, because uh, we've got the FIT contracts and a lot of these FIT contracts are coming up for um, the expiration of warranties on the inverters on them because most inverters, I think the longest warranty period on most inverters is 10 years in the market, unless you chose to purchase an extended warranty, in which case you would have the warranty last for 20 years. Now, supposing you've got an old system on which your inverter need not necessarily be a Fronius inverter. Is it I don't see your screen at the moment. Oh, you don't? Okay. That's no, right. you may have stopped sharing. Were you able to see it when I was showing you the other thing? Um, geez. Um, the Earlier, yeah, we can see it. Okay. 
Um, no, I just see the Baywall Fronius page right now. Do you see there, it now? There we go. Yes. Okay. okay, sorry. So coming back to the retrofits, right? So retrofits is basically uh, you have an existing solar system, okay, and you've got some component of said solar system whose warranty is either expired or about to expire or is not functioning. So more often than not, the first thing that will go belly up on your system is electronics, which basically is the inverter. Now, supposing you've got an inverter which, um, whose manufacturer is either no longer in the market as you know, they've wound up service, or maybe they've sold off their service to some other person, or you basically have having a hard time getting parts and components or service for your system, in which case a lot of people will come to us and say, suggest me something such that I can get Tronis inverters on these. So what we normally do is in, in those situations, we, we ask for them to supply us with you know, information because like I mentioned earlier, 10 years is a long time and a lot of the technology when it comes to the solar inverters has changed between them and now. And, and um, if you had built your system with a transformer-based inverter, then there is some due diligence you will need to do, do before you throw on um, a transformerless inverter, um, else you might end up you know, damaging said transformerless inverter which is the reason why we came up with this, where uh, we offer a webinar, again, this is by request, where um, if, you know, what would need to be taken into account anytime you're trying to retrofit an older system, because it's not um, as simple as a, uh, you know, straight out swap of an inverter. And if you didn't follow through with all of the recommended procedures and practices, you might end up shortening the life of the new inverter or even have it just fail on you at, at the outset. Okay, and yeah, now outside of this, um, one of the tools which we do offer for um, from the support perspective is what we call SOS, which is not Save Our Souls, it's more of solar online support. It's a browser based uh, tool, okay, but you will need to have an account and it is mobile phone compatible, which means that basically, you know, uh, if you open the same browser page on a computer or a big, you know, full screen as opposed to a phone, th sometimes the page will get crunched up. Uh, which will not be a problem for you here because this tool was made to be used on a mobile platform, all right? And so what you would do is you'd sign up for an account here. You will need to talk to tech support should you want to sign up for an account. And there's a good deal of uh, self um, troubleshooting which you can accomplish because it's a step-by-step -step approach. And if you aren't able to solve the problem at the end of the day but, you know, through the SOS tool, you can put in a request to the support queue through the tool itself, all right? So it'll email us direct from there. So you wouldn't have to sit up and compose a separate email for us. And, depend, and if you were a Proneus service provider and you've been trained, you can actually request exchanges here. Um, so only Proneus service providers can request exchanges from here. But for any other purpose in terms of requesting support, you can always contact us through the Proneus SOS tool. And you can even try fixing stuff yourself. If you can, all good, you, you know, you're set. If you weren't able to fix it yourself, you can always use the tool to contact us. Now, um, there's a few myths that we want to address, which um, it quite often you know, crops up in conversation. Um, so anytime you're trying to design a solar array, a lot of people um, try to do the old school method. Uh, you know, you go with an engineer, you get an um, Excel sheet, and then you get, you get your cut sheets from the PV module manufacturer, and you plug in your numbers and you do it. There's nothing wrong with that approach, that's fine. That's literally how even we make our tools, but that, approach leaves out one very important uh, rider, which is every manufacturer's device has parameter limits. When you make your own hand calculations, either with an Excel tool or you get in touch with a consulting engineer, you are not taking or making accommodation for device constraints. So anytime we, not just me, any manufacturer pushes you to use their tool, the reason is not that they don't trust your calculations, they also want to make sure that your design is safe for their device. Okay, because um, you know we make uh, the highest DC voltage you can have on our tools is a thousand volts DC, right? But depending on the the string length, as in the number of PV modules you've got in series on said string, and the site conditions, which is basically the entire temperature range, you might have a sub-performing um, system if you did not take into account parameter limits. So this is the reason why manufacturers will keep you know, harping on using their design tool. It isn't that they don't trust your designs. They do trust your designs, but they do know that you're also ignoring device constraints when you when you go with the old school Excel method of calculation. Having said that, 
Um, a lot of the tools on the market, including ours, are actually very intuitive. So always want, what you want to do is play with the tool first. Make sure you understand how the tool is made, and then you will get a better feel to make sense of what numbers the tool spits up. Okay. Now, if you need help, you can always call in. We also do conduct webinars on the tool itself so that you can get the most out of your tool. Okay, now uh, remember I was telling you earlier that there's different ways you can tackle shading issues in system performance issues, especially if you have shading concerns. So this was, um, what should I say, um, a study that was performed by Fronius. What we do and what everybody does, anybody who's in the product um, you know, manufacturing business is always buying your competitors' products, tearing them down and doing a thorough reverse analysis on them and, and putting them through all different sorts of tests to make sure that you know you're still as competitive on the market because if you didn't do this you'd become obsolete pretty soon so what we did was uh, we collected a few different types of module level um, you know micro inverters if you will we just you know, use this blanket term for them mlve which is short for module level power electronics and we made a comparison and we what we observed was that outside of the seasons where your panels are actually buried under snow the Fronis algorithm outperforms module level power electronics pretty much every season. Okay, so unless you're actually in a place where you'd expect for your snowpack to grossly affect your production, you wouldn't really want to, you know, go down the module level power electronics route simply because, um, like I mentioned earlier and alluded to as well, uh, electronics is the first thing to fail, not the last. So your PV module is the last thing to fail, not the first. So what you're doing is your your it's kind of like the fence eating the crop, except you know your fence itself is more prone to dying than the crop situation. So if you're concerned about efficiency, the seasons where your module level power tanks will truly stand you you know some advantage is those seasons where your PV modules are completely buried under snow. Now, in terms of safety, uh, we we all know that uh, you know I'm sure everybody's heard of solar fires and things like that. What you always have to keep in mind is um, the safety of your system is a function of the quality of components. But most people just chalk it up to quality of components and leave it there. That's actually incorrect. So uh, the safety of your system is very grossly a function of the quality of the installation, the workmanship. Okay, and the workmanship is directly influenced by how easy or how difficult it is to install a certain piece of equipment. And how easy or how difficult is it to install said piece of equipment has a lot to do with how well you are supported and, and trained before you get your hands on the material, which is the reason why we keep harping on catch them before they do something wrong. In the sense, not to say people you know, are, you know, are not good at reading manuals or installing, it's just that every inverter manufacturer is different. Just because you've got experience with one make of inverter does not mean that would necessarily transfer as effectively to another make of inverter. So that is why we always offer you training on demand if you're working on Fronies for the first time. We also recommend calling it in because there's plenty of simple thumb rules, which if you adopt into your installations, you, it'll save you a lot of headache in the long run. And it'll also show you that, you know, if you do listen to the manufacturer's advice, when it comes to the way you install things, instead of just going by gut feeling or based off of past experience, you will get much more out of your system and the way you would look at the system will change too, okay? Now in terms of safety, the, le the leading causes of fires on PV systems, it could be inverters, it could be power electronics, it could be, it could be connectors and terminals, okay? What we have observed is, a lot of the time, if you do have a, an issue with a system, it's um, you know it could be your connectors. More often than not, it is the connectors, okay? Because um, one myth that a lot of people have is we, they, there's a lot of talk about universal connectors. Uh, we strictly discourage universal connectors because there is no such thing as a universal connector, despite how aggressively somebody touts it in the market or promotes it. Okay, so you always want to make sure that you do a good job and don't cut any corners, okay? Because at the outset, everybody knows you're looking at your capital outlay, but you also have to keep in mind that these systems are built to last you or are expected to last you between 10 and 20 years. And in 10 and 20 years, the kind of weather you would experience would be wild in the sense, you know, you cannot predict weather. You cannot predict other conditions like, you know, what is the quality of your power supply coming down the utility for you? How is the system handled? How is the upkeep on the system? Is there even upkeep at all? Is there monitoring on the system? Again, like I said, monitoring is not, you know, for you to do show and tell. Yes, there's a nice, you know, bells and whistles you can have on the system, but it's a health monitor. And just having your health monitor didn't mean that, you know, the system's not going to look after itself. Somebody's got to act on the alarms provided by your health monitor. All of these matter. 
okay and so um, you, you already see that you know your connections and your electronics are the the primary points of failure okay so now if i've got module level power electronics i'm literally throwing electronics under every pv module okay and the pv module is in the worst possible place for electronics because it receives the harshest of whatever the weather throws it right and so why would you want to put something that's got that's that you know is going to fail in the worst possible place and the caveat is even if they did fail there's no guarantee that they don't fail at the same time they, because you know we don't know how they're going to be ex, uh, exposed to the weather and the elements and how they get uh, you know aged so the more number of connection points you have the more is your risk for failure okay and the, the more is your risk for human error simply because human error is not something you can do away with so the more and more electronics you keep throwing on the more and more points of connection the more and more points of connection the more and more chances for failure and you know the less safe the system is so this can be argued from both sides but we already know that if i were to have only one connection i've got a certain failure rate as opposed to if i have 10 then you couldn't expect the 10 connections to have the same failure rate as one connection um, outside of this a lot of people will come to you and say how do i know if i if my pv module is failed and the irony is a little you know strange because um your pv module is literally the last thing that's going to fail on the solar array okay and given that the downward trend of the cost of pv modules uh, and the upward trend of the cost of electronics you're you're throwing something that's much more expensive and much more likely to fail to monitor something that's much less expensive and the and you know the least likely component to fail on your system so in, if you're concerned about you know you losing out because you, you you suspect your PV modules might be failing, you might be better off increasing the size of the DC array rather than throwing more electronics, which will fail before the array itself fails. Uh, there's one other thing that I, I cut that out, but uh, yeah. Now in in like kind of uh, just rounding this back up to the ease of installation, uh, you know it's really easy to install. Should you need to have to exchange or change something out, it's very easy to swap. Now, um, in terms of what you can and cannot do on the monitoring, I just wanted to do a live demonstration of our solar web platform. So just taking you here. Um, can you see my display? Yes. Okay, um, so this is what you would get to see if you were to go with a regular, uh, you know, um, PV system connected to solar web without a smart meter. This is, um, uh, are you able to see this full or is it sc uh, scrunched up? Uh, it is a little scrunched. <laughs> okay, I'm not able to lower the resolution anymore. So what I'll do is I'll kind of gently scroll through it so you get to see it before, all right? So here, were you to not have, uh, what should I say? Um, a, a smart meter, this is how the landing page for the monitoring website looks like. This system is what we have on our office here in Mississauga. It's a really brilliant day here. It's, it's, you know, it's like spring for us, it's 20 degrees and there's not a cloud in the sky. And hence you can see that our uh, production curve is the perfect solar curve, but not necessarily the best because it's not exactly peak summer, okay? So um, you, uh, a lot of the value that you gain from the system is in how you set it up and, and uh, you paying attention to service messages should you receive any, all right? So currently you can see that our inverter is a six kilowatt single phase primer and it's putting out 3.04, which is you know, a utilization of just over 50% of the capacity of the inverter and the array, all right? And this is the energy balance that you can see for so far today. The energy balance is only updated once every hour. The parameters are sampled in five minute intervals, okay? Now I'm just gonna take you to the analysis tab. Now if you do need to perform any sort of analysis with your production history, you can perform that here, all right? So I'm going to go to the history and I'm, I'm choosing this here. Now, if you do have multiple inverters or you've had other inverters in the past, you'll get to see them all here. So here you can see that I've got a Primo Gen 2410 right now, but in the past I did have a six kilowatt inverter. So my apologies, we actually switched out the six with a 10, right? So that's the reason you can see it here, but I can't make a choice because that has been replaced with the new one here. Now, um, in the list of parameters, you can choose different parameters or the, the parameter that i would be most interested in looking at is total power okay so i'm going to choose that and i'm going to say okay and i will get a plot 
till the last hour because like I told you earlier, the plot itself is updated once every hour, but real time power is visible in close to real time, all right? So this is for today. And as I move my cursor across the plot, you will see the numbers and the timestamps update themselves on the left. And if you are paying attention, you will see that the timestamps jump at five minute increments. Do you see that? Okay, so that's your production plot for so far, or I would say till the last hour today. I'm gonna to change your plot to the monthly view. So that will give me a bar chart with a daily production proportional to the height of that bar, right? So if I'm gonna move my mouse across each of those bars, it'll tell you which day that bar was for, and it'll give you the value of the energy accumulated on that day. The top right corner shows you the value of the accumulated energy, for the days so far this month till the last hour, okay? Now the same logic holds if I were to um, um, be interested in looking at the monthly bar chart production so far this year. The number in the top right corner is an accumulation of the energy so far, um, you know, till the last hour, but um, it is pro um, displayed as a monthly bar chart. And just like how I move my mouse over each of the days of the month, the same logic holds here as I move my mouse over each of the months of the year so far. So you can see that our best month was June. And were I to click on that bar chart, it'll give me the daily bar chart for the days of June. And it looks like the 18th of June was our best day. We made 42.41 kilowatt hours. So I'm gonna click on that. And you'll see this was our production call for that day. And you can see that the array is not oversized. If the array was oversized, then you would see a flat topping offset curve. Now, if I do want to see whatever the production was in terms of the accumulated yearly values for the number of years this inverter has been installed, I'm gonna click here. And you'll see that this inverter was actually installed only last year because we used to have the six kilowatt unit before that. And so now I'm gonna break that up to the day in October last year. Okay, we had it here and it looks like we encountered some problems. So we didn't have any production here and the production picked up again on the 28th of October last year. And if I were to look at the production chart for that day, you'll see it wasn't particularly a nice day. Okay, so that's as far as um, the analysis goes on your production history. Now, were you to experience any issues with the system, then they would be showing up here under service messages. And you can see that you, you can set a time range. In the last week, we've not really had any service messages. I'm gonna change that time ray, uh, the range to the last 30 days. And you will see that there were some error messages and it'll give you a description of what the error message is and what the status code is. It'll say AC main line voltage uh, below the inverter's reconnect limit, which is basically we had an, a voltage issue, okay? And it'll also tell you what day and what time that error message showed up. Okay, now uh, what is the value in these error messages? If you have to sign into the system to see the error messages, there is no value. So what we would do in those situations is you would go to settings and under contacts, you will see that you can put in your email or whoever else is in, in charge of looking uh, after the system, you would put in their emails here and you can see here that I've got my email in here and I have chosen to receive both service messages and reports. So anytime the system is experiencing any sort of trouble, it will email whoever signed up here to receive those emails, and you can actually set the frequency as well for those. All right, I'll show it to you in just a bit. Now, in terms of components, your system is comprised of two parts. One is the inverter itself, and the second is your communication card. Each of these devices is a separate unit by itself, and they will receive their own software updates. The inverter that you are seeing here on this system is not yet launched in the market, so you won't see this in the market, but this is the system we've got, so I'm just showing it to you here. And you can see that there is an update available for the communication card, but there is no update available for the inverter itself because it's already got the latest update installed on it. Okay, now outside of these, let's go to the place where you would set up the service messages on the system, here. So here's where you can see that the service messages would be set up on the system. I have chosen to be notified um, in, in 12 hour increments if there was no production. Okay, now there is no battery on my inverter here. That's the reason battery blackout detection is deactivated, okay? And if the inverter did not make you any uh, energy at all for 24 hours, you'd be notified here as well. You can change that too, okay? Now this is for a system without a smart meter. Were you to have a smart meter, your system will look like this, okay? Are you able to see my display here? You might not see the full thing, but what I'm currently focusing on is the four quadrant bubble chart that you get to see here, okay? 
So you can see that the energy balance today has a baseline, which is zero. Anything below the baseline is whatever energy you purchase from the utility. Anything above the baseline is whatever energy you sold back to the utility. So you can see here that the current system, which comprises of more than one inverter, by the way, is making you 36.3 kilowatts. 10.2 kilowatts is being cons consumed on the property. It's a farm, if you want to look further here. So you can see the array here. It is in Manitoba. Okay. And um, 26 uh, and a little just over 26 kilowatts is being put back onto the utility, which is Manitoba Hydro here, because they've got a pretty sweet contract where they get paid pretty, you know, a, a good sum uh, for the energy they put back on the utility. Okay, now let's go back to our presentation. Okay, so that was a live demonstration of our monitoring platform with and without a smart meter in the picture. If you do have any questions, uh, I can take them now. Thanks, Harsha. Uh, there's just one more, Mike asks, uh, sorry if I missed it, but can a Primo be mounted on the roof next to the array without a separate RSB required? Um, I mean, yes, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of lost in the sense without a separate RSB required. See, I know that in certain jurisdictions, you can have the inverter mounted within three feet of the array and not have rapid shutdown. Is that what they are basically asking them about? I believe so. Yes, you can, but it's just that, you know, if you are going to be mounting it on the roof and, you know, if it is going to be mounted in a place where it is going to get a lot of light on it, we recommend that you use a shade cover. So is it possible? Absolutely. Okay, are there any last questions out there, folks? Is there a time estimate for a for 600 volt inverter? Um, you'll have to clarify that a bit more because we already make 600, are you, are you, is that 600 volt DC or 600 volt AC? AC. Yeah, we will not make a 600 volt AC inverter. Um, so just so you're aware, anytime you prove a product, uh, a lot of work goes into the product, okay? And our market for 600 volt inverters is only exclusively in Canada. And uh, you know the volume of sales we have what does not justify re-engineering a product because a lot of our competitors in the past have tried this. What they do is they just give you an interface circuit on the AC side, which converts 600 to you know whatever the, the product was designed for. But they've had multiple failures because a lot of people don't realize it's not a quick fix. You have to re-engineer the product. It's like making you a new product when you make it for 600 volts AC. Okay. Which is the reason uh, why a lot of uh, people who build systems for 600 volts AC, when they come back for a retrofit, they'd rather choose a Fromis with a transformer because we have a proven design. We know it works for 480. So you know uh, what the people do is they they have you know faith in us. So they'd rather build a system for 480 and use an interfacing transformer in between. Great. Okay, I see that's it for questions. So thank you, Harsha. Uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to educate us all a bit more on Fronius. A uh, couple of notes before we go. Uh, all pricing, spec sheets, warranty, install, manuals, incoming POs can be found on our web shop. So those of you who have not uh, signed up, I'd like to encourage you to do that. This was recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel here within a couple of hours, and it'll also come out in our next newsletter. If you have more information, please reach out to one of our many sales reps. Uh, they're quite knowledgeable on Fronius, and we have Fronius in stock across our four warehouses across Canada. So once again, thank you everybody for attending, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you for attending, and thank you for having me. Bye-bye.